talk for today and introduce uh, Dr. Jasmine Jones is an assistant professor of computer science at Beret College. Uh, she received her PhD in information science from the University of Michigan. Her research and teaching focus on understanding the human experience of physical computing technologies and promoting the inclusion of diverse imaginaries in the design process. Um, so I'm really excited about this lecture today. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Jasmine Jones. Hi everybody. Um, thank you, Christina, for inviting me and for um, sort of creating this space where we can talk about our work. Um, it's, it is fine if you want to just post pick, um, questions and things in the chat as I'm going. Um, if you have questions or you just have, you know, a thought that you want to put in there, um, that's fine. And I'll just kind of pause when it makes sense to um, kind of review questions. Um, although, but if you if you have a question, uh, it's fine for you to put it in the chat. If you want to say it, though, put I have a question in the chat because I can't see everybody in the sort of Zoom window. So if you have your hand raised, I, I can't necessarily see you. Um, but yeah, so I'll just jump right in here. And um, if I can, uh, if you can use the reactions to kind of give me a show of hands of how many people in the here are undergraduates and then people who are graduates. Okay, so mostly grad students, okay. And then folks who are mainly maybe computer science focused. Okay, and then people who are more digital media design focused. Okay, okay, cool. And then I see a few guests here. Um, who are even post post uh, grad. So great. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about sort of my journey and thinking about future user experiences. And um, so my background in particular is um, uh, as a computer science and a computer scientist and as an ethnographer. So um, my approach is going to be a little bit maybe a little bit different than those of you who might have formally studied design um, and also maybe formally studied digital media and things. So. Um, just like to kind of say a little bit about myself um, in terms of my background, because I think it it always shapes the way that we come through these different um, these different research topics. Um, and I I just like to point out also to students that it's you can do a lot of different things with kind of the backgrounds that you have. Um, in this field of HCI is really nice because it's so interdisciplinary. You can come at it from a lot of different ways. So. Um, Let's see, make sure this, all right. So um, a little bit about, since we're all virtual, this is where I am right now. I'm in Berea, Kentucky. I'm a assistant professor at Berea College. Um, and it's kind of here nestled in the foothills of the Appalachians. Um, and it's kind of very scenic. And it's also it's not quite rural, um, but it's really definitely not urban. And in, it, it kind of contrasts to where y'all might be um, in Chicago or um, if you're not there, you know, if you're living in a city. Um, and it's uh, because my research area is dealing with sort of technological futures, it's kind of interesting to think about it in spaces and places like this, where, you know, if I say there's, there's going to be technology and it's going to be everywhere and we're going to be super interconnected and it's going to be networks and infrastructures and everything. Um, and then you look around and it's trees for miles and it's sort of nature in all its glory. Um, it, it hits a little different when we're out here versus when we're in sort of an urban space. Um, so it's kind of interesting, you know, to, to think about these, this idea about future user experiences being in sort of not so much of an urban space like in our Ann Arbor or in Minneapolis um, or Baltimore, where I did a lot of my study. Um, so this, this talk is going to be a lot more about kind of more storytelling form. Um, I'll go into a little bit of detail about some of my work, but I know some of you have kind of read some of the papers or reviewed some of the things on my admittedly not great website. Um, so if you have questions, uh, uh, more details or something, I'm happy to go into more detail or to kind of revisit things either as I'm going or at the end. So please just feel free to chime in. But in general, what I'm going to talk about today is um, talking about 
things, like what are the things that we expect to, to come up in future, um, future UX design? What are the things we wanna create? Um, what are some of the, the future users that we want to consider? And how does our, uh, how does the way we think about users change when we're thinking about future, um, future experiences? Um, what does future even mean? Like when does the future start and how do we account for things that, you know, we've never seen before? And then um, I also want to think about a little bit what, what is the kind of experiences that we're going to allow as UX designers um, and as people who are invested in hopefully, you know, doing good and promoting positive in, uh, interactions with technologies. So I'll kind of a little bit of time in each one of these and by the end hopefully there'll be like a uh, sort of weave a thread of a story about how my thinking about future user experiences has evolved and changed um well to start off thinking about the things um since my i i come at this from the perspective of the vision of ubiquitous computing that was um, proposed by mark weiser back in 91 1991 and uh, the vision sort of proposed that technologies will not just be our desktops, our laptops, our phones, um, mainframes and devices, but it will be actually woven into the fabric of everyday life. Um, that um, technologies will take the form of things that are familiar, um, that they'll be unremarkable, that we might not even notice that whatever it is that we're interacting with is in fact, a computational interface. Um, and so that's the vision that I am looking forward to um, when I think about future UX design is this idea of ubiquitous computing. And um, I, I, let's show of hands, who has seen Minority Report <laughs> in this? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, it's a, I mean, it's a great movie, but I realize now as I'm getting older that not everybody, it's not everybody has seen it. So I'll update my image. Okay, so uh, an interface, when we think about it, is the frame that controls how a user accesses the information or function of your system. So in this case, it's kind of an augmented reality interface where the physical component that um, the driver can grab and they're actually sitting somewhere and there's actually a seat belt, but everything that they see, right, is um, sort of projected in, into their experience. And then a user experience is how we want users, the people who are interacting with this interface and this frame to think and feel and interact. Um, and so it's interesting to think about sort of the distinction between interfaces and user experience um, because they have been largely separate. Um, usually when we think about the, uh, user-centered design process um, in UX design, we think about how do we design the system, the interface, how do we make sure it's usable, and then we start thinking about user experience after we've kind of gotten the structure of what we want to be developed. Um, but when we're thinking about ubiquitous computing, where the person might not even know that they're actually interacting with something computational, or they're interacting with it in a way that's so familiar that they're not really thinking about the fact that they're interacting with the computer. And so this idea of interface and experience are much more intertwined. Um, so if we kind of walk through the history of interfaces, um, you know, we started with text-based interfaces where you had to have very, a lot of familiarity with how computers work in order to really interact with something computational. And then we moved into um, graphical user interfaces that started using metaphors and visual imagery and tokens to allow people to um, use their understanding about the world in order to interact with um, a computational interface. And we've moved on. We're starting now to see more tangible user interfaces, which is where I think you know stuff starts to get interesting, where we have more natural user interactions, people kind of just grab onto things and use the affordances of objects in order to figure out how this uh, technology is supposed to work. Um, and we see these kind of being used in a lot of different ways from interior design to uh, musical interfaces, musical interactions. Um, and we're moving on to like wearable devices, um, where this like Mimo smart baby monitor to uh, is like a medical device for babies to monitor their uh, the blood oxygen level so that parents can kind of rest easy when their babies are sleeping in another room, and then the skin put device that pro just projects um, sort of an ephemeral interface onto your um, onto your skin so that you can interact 
at the time when you want it and then it disappears whenever you're you're done with it and we, we're even seeing things like you know computational tattoos that allow you to sort of interact with um uh, different computational functionality without really having to think about the fact that you're um, interacting with a machine and we're seeing um, embodied and voice activated assistants that are trying to trying to move us more into thinking about how do we interact with the world rather than how do we interact with this machine? So Jibo uh, robot um, that was unfortunately discontinued was more of like a friendly, you know, kitchen appliance uh, that kind of took pictures when you asked it to, or it could give you information if you talked to it and just kind of told jokes or something. Um, and then Paro, the robotic seal, that's a substitute for therapeutic animals um, that was really popular in Japan and it's kind of also now made its way over into the US. Um, and the point of these kind of devices is that you're not interacting with a computer anymore, right? It's just the computer that help, makes it interactive, but really you're interacting with the thing. Um, and so now we started to think less about like, how do we design this interface and more about how do we create this experience with these, um, with these different objects. And then we've also got virtual reality um, and we've been thrown into virtual experiences, uh, unfortunately, quickly with this, the whole pandemic style. Um, but um, there's still a lot of enthusiasm for the future of what virtual reality could be an augmented and extended reality, um, where it's not necessarily the thing that you've built, you've actually just fabricated an environment for a person to in act and interact in. Um, and and then we've in even moving in even further, we've thought about well, we've got these devices and we've kind of been able to alter the environment, but what about the body, the human body? Like that's the last frontier. So how do we make ourselves stronger and faster using exoskeletons and um, even thinking about the transhumanism movement? Or how do we sort of actually augment the body itself or change it or replace bits that we don't like and add bits that we do like or encapsulate and translate our consciousness using different technologies. So we've, we've kind of thinking about future user experiences on into the future. We sort of, we started moving away from this idea of this dichotomy between an interface and an experience and had to think about them all together. Um, but this also poses some difficulty and challenge for us um, as UX designers because we have to think about what we even mean by user experience. Who's the user when you don't know you're interacting with something? Um, you know, with, if everything is embedded and woven into everyday life, what does that mean for what we normally typically think about as um, the experience of the particular target person that we're designing for? So we've got cool stuff coming down the pipeline. I think a lot of these future devices and interfaces and things um, are really interesting, but they come with uh, caveats. They come with questions and they come with challenges that we need to address. So how do we know that it worked? You know, we're talking about not just building a new technology, but we're talking about building a new experience. How do we know this experience is working the way we intended? How do we know that it's actually good for us? Um, how do we, what do we do if people don't like it? Um, and what do we do if we've forgotten someone, if we've left something out? Um, and we've seen a lot of conversation um, and debate and um, a lot of hard turns and pivots happening now because we're living in a current reality where people have been systematically excluded from the visions of but what technology could be now. And we've realized it, you know, we've realized things like algorithmic bias and having to, like pr privacy protections, um, you know, that have been the current technological environments that we currently have are a vision that didn't include all of us. And so when we're thinking about moving forward into the future, how do we make sure that we make things that are inclusive of all the people who will be present in the future that we're imagining? So that's what I want to deal with. And so I'm going to maybe talk through a little, a few of my projects about how I've tried to um, sort of think about these different issues about um, not only understanding in the evaluation of the interface, but also like how do we consider the people who are involved and being affected and impacted through this. So I'll start with 
the question, what happens when we forget somebody? Um, because this is one of um, the experiences that sort of shapes the way that I think about user experience design and um, design of computational devices. Uh, and this uh, story comes from the setting when I was doing a research project back in 2013 um, as a graduate student um, in Sierra Leone, working with a school for the blind. And I was there to look at what kind of technologies could enhance and promote the existing sort of educational uh, efforts that were happening there to um, get people, young people who were blind um, into and through school and into the workforce. Um, so that was what I was there to kind of study and look at. Um, and the setting, like this picture uh, that I'm showing is kind of from uh, an elementary school. So they had, you know, typewriters and, and computers and the students would learn braille um, and other different study skills from about first grade to sixth grade. So their elementary schools were schools for the blind. They were sort of targeted and directed for them. Um, and they had a lot of like really great equipment. Um, but at the time, um, Sierra Leone as a country was just emerging from a really awful civil war. And so the infrastructure and, and um, the access to resources was really bad. Uh, it was in terms of like um, levels of countries and in, in the poverty index that was maintained by the UN, uh, Sierra Leone was pretty close to the bottom. Um, and so like, even though in this picture you're seeing like these pristine Dell computers in this school for the blind, that was not the reality for most people in other countries. Most people had never even used a computer. Um, students and who didn't have the chance to go to um, schools that were well resourced like this um, were mostly you know, still taking notes by hand. And so when these um, students who were at these schools for the blind that were rather well resourced because of the accessibility needs of the students. They would go to high school and these high schools were integrated. And so when they would get to um, an integrated high school, they, um, they would bring their typewriters or their computers with them and copy notes. And so this, this kind of what this quote was saying, like they, they actually did a lot better than other students, even though they had uh, this disability that they were trying to overcome. They also had all these other resources with the technology that they were able to use and leverage to outperform a lot of the other students who didn't have the same um, accessibility barriers. Um, so this seems at, on its uh, surface like a technology success. Um, the technology helped them to gain access to education, to even do better than students um, who, who were not blind, um, and also to sort of integrate well into a high school setting and to continue on um, into you know further their education. However, everything outside of just that classroom was incredibly inaccessible. So although they could use their computers to take notes and get get the information from the teacher and to take and to like do their exams, once they stepped out of the classroom, you know, getting to and from the school, you know, they had a staircase that they had to go up and the stairs were sometimes broken. And so if you step the wrong way, you could really fall and hurt yourself. So they had to always ask other seeing students, you know, can you help me navigate these stairs to get into the school building? And then the road that was leading from their homes into the school was very dangerous. There were no sidewalks and these cars would drive really fast and you had to kind of avoid the gutter on one end and the car dri fast driving cars on the other side. So they would have to ask other seeing students, like, can you help me get from my home, you know, to the school? Um, and then, you know, during school, you know, you have lunch and you want to you know, you go to town to get food or to get your supplies. We needed help to do that too. Um, and so they relied a lot on the on um, seeing students to um, just actually just participate in the school environment to get to the classroom where they could um, and have this educational experience. But the school, um, like many sort of European system schools, ranked students from based on their performance, and that ranking determined what you could do, like whether you could um, go to certain colleges or what kind of jobs you could be eligible to apply for. And so since these blind students were outperforming all the other seeing students, the seeing students would stop helping them. 
right? Like they were seen as having an unfair advantage because they had these technologies. Um, and so the seeing students were like, well, we're not gonna help you do anything else because it's not beneficial for us, for you to just come in here and um, outperform us. And that's, uh, that's very sad, and, but it's understandable if you think about it, you know, it's uh, the country didn't have a lot of opportunities and everything was a competition. Um, and then these, these kids had, had an unfair advantage, like that's, that's the way that it was seen. Um, and so if, in this case, if we, we hadn't thought about the fact that they're living in a social environment, um, that it's not just about their classroom experience, not just about getting the information from the teacher and remembering it and putting it back down on the test, it's also about getting to and from the place where they can get an education and creating connections and building social capital to allow them to be successful in all the areas of their life. Um, if we don't think about that, then we also call the technology success. But if we do think about that, if we think about the fact that these technologies, when they were introduced into this new setting, totally disrupted the social fabric of this school environment for these students, for these blind students, um, then maybe the technology is not so successful. So this experience is, uh, and seeing this and talking to the students about both the seeing students and the blind students about why this was happening and what was happening, it really helped me to see that when we're thinking about introducing new technologies into a particular situation, not only just the technology, but we wanna change the situation itself, we really need to think about more than just our users. We need to think broader than, um, broader than directly the people that we want to design for. So this leads to, um, I guess my key point uh, for the, the presentation, but then also this is my research agenda, is this idea that interactive technologies that are physically embedded, so this like, vision of ubiquitous computing where technologies are all around us and in every aspect of our life, um, they're also socially entangled. Um, when we think about our user, we have to also think about all the other people that are interacting and influencing and being influenced by the person that has this device or that is interacting with this system. Um, and there's, we can also think even further about people who are not necessarily directly connected to this person, but are somehow engaged in the functionality and working of the system. So this shift in my, um, in my thoughts um, is kind of what motivated this idea of socially embedded computing, of thinking about um, the design of technologies, the future user experiences uh, as being not never individual, it, uh, always being about multiple people and how they're interacting together. Um, so I will um, kind of move on. To, if there's no questions about this part, I'll kind of keep keep going. And I'll sort of move on into talking about a little bit about a project that I did in family storytelling um, that sort of followed this initial experience and in thinking about design from a social perspective. So in my, um, also in graduate school, uh, my dissertation was kind of, was focused on preserving and sharing family memories. Um, and initially I thought this would be just a quick, interesting project to do. Like I'll build this, um, I'll build this system and I'll test it. And then I'll use that to sort of just gain a few new skills. But as an ethnographer, I always have to start with asking people what it is that they do, what it is that they think, understanding their practices. Um, so I started by looking at what all the different current memory technologies are out there. And there was just, there's, there's almost hundreds of papers about technologies for memory for reminiscing, for reflection, for retrospection, for uh, future inspection. Um, and so, you know, these, these technologies range from the photo box, which took um, pictures from your past and printed them out randomly, um, to the FM radio, which recorded um, uh, audio recordings from family trips, to the lover's box, which had different little artifacts that could be shared between couples. Um, but all of these devices I noticed focus on the person doing the remembering. And the work that I wanted to do was on families 
who wanted to remember it together. So I started to think about how am I going to approach this idea of design for memory as a social process, not just as an individual um, or even just a shared process. So in order to do this, um, I conducted a story tour. Um, and so viewing storytelling as a process of conveying information, um, I went out and recruited about, um, about 20 people, um, older adults who were sort of older than 50 and then younger adults who were mostly in their 20s, but no older than 40. And sort of doing, recruiting these different generations to kind of talk about what kind of stories about their family do they want to talk about? Do they want to convey to the next generation? And then to the younger people, what kind of stories do they want to know about their family? Um, and these story tours viewed the stories that they were telling as the artifact that they were trying to pass back and forth. Um, so trying to think about this as kind of like heirlooms and mementos, thinking about the stories as those things. And then I wanted to focus on what people's practices were around sharing those things. Um, so I asked them about what their challenges were, as well as what their hopes and what their practices were. So people who wanted to share and people who wanted to know um, described that they just wanted to kind of gather as much information as they could about their family so that they could know it for themselves and then also be able to share it. But one of the challenges um, that came up was that um, for people who were storytellers, people who were older, um, older adults, but who wanted to share with future generations, they often couldn't just make the decision to, to tell a story. Um, they, sometimes they had siblings or cousins who would say, no, we don't, we don't talk about that. We can't share that story. Um, and the same thing for younger generations. Um, sometimes they have you know, some information, some story that they wanna hear about. And um, so they go and they ask someone like, oh, can you tell me a story about this? What was it like for you growing up here? Or what was this person like when they were younger? And they get sort of silence or they get people kind of dodging the question. Um, and so they found they had to kind of use almost like detective strategies to figure out what, what was going on here? What was, what was the actual story here? Why are people so reluctant to talk about these things? Um, and um, so for the people who were trying to share and to know, there, was, there, there were barriers about finding information. So being able to ask questions to people and tracking down the people who knew, but they also had barriers about knowing the story was there in the first place. Um, they, and even when they found especially artifacts like diaries or journals or heirlooms or the stories themselves that um, were available to them um, or even things like census records, sort of historical artifacts. And you know, they had to work, like ha exert a lot of work to understand what the content was. Sometimes it wasn't in the language that they spoke if their families were from coming from a different country or it was in a script that they didn't read um, quite a few people talked about the fact that they had, they had never learned cursive. So, you know, older generations who wrote their entire diary in cursive, they had to find someone else to be able to read it. Um, and then just kind of understanding what it is that people are talking about. You know, someone's talking about something that happened in the 1920s over in rural Kansas, you know, and you live in New York, you know, there's all kinds of terms and terminologies and just things that you just have no context to understand. Um, and then the other thing that um, we kind of realized is that a lot of stories change over time. Um, and sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, right? Everybody tells a story their own way. They emphasize things that are important to them or that they think are interesting and they leave things out that they don't think are interesting or that they don't wanna share. Um, but it's impossible for a person listening to know how the stories change unless you go and ask everybody who could possibly know. Um, so, so all of these different contexts and barriers about sharing and knowing are like helps me realize that I'm not actually trying to build just one device. Um, there's all these different types of practices that are going into um, sharing stories, hearing stories, or preventing stories from being told at all. 
Um, so many people talked about a boundary, silences, protecting different people, exercising discretion, um, or wanting having a story, wanting to tell, but not to that person, or not right now, or only when this person has gone through um, a certain experience or has passed a certain age, then they can know. Um, and so the, the design frame went from how can I create a device for that to allow different generations to share and preserve their memories to how can I create um, experiences that allow people to think about, reflect on, and plan about when they want to share their stories, who they want to share them with, when they want to share them, how much do they want to share. Um, and for people who are hearing these different stories, how do they want to encounter them? What do they want to know? Who do they want to learn from? And so that's kind of something that I'm working on now is like, how do I think about all these different types of media, but also all these different types of stories and all these different types of practices around these stories that create this sort of storytelling experience that is familiar to families um, in a more technological scenario. Um, and the, the challenge, the challenge in all of this is the, the main reason why people would wanna share stories or hear about stories is because once the person has passed away or once they've moved away, the story itself is lost if it hasn't been told. And so trying to basically beat time in order to um, sort of gather up as much information in someone's own words and from someone's own perspective is one of the main motivators for people who are kind of going out and doing a lot of this um, storytelling and historical research work. Um, so, so that's kind of an interesting um, case of how thinking, moving away from just studying people individually about their own memories, but thinking about everyone who's involved, not just the storyteller and the person telling the story, but also all the other people in the family who have some sort of stake in what story gets told and who it gets told to, um, is can sort of really complicate the, the user experience design process um, and in good ways, in good ways, um, so that you can sort of think more creatively and broadly about what it is the scenarios that we're intending for. So um, moving on from just um, memory boxes, basically, to thinking more about different devices that take into account all the social aspects and um, the, all the, the different relationships that are actually at, at play and the, the story, family storytelling process. It's future work coming soon, maybe next year, Kai. So the next question um, that comes up along with like, how do you consider multiple users um, and sort of multiplicity of people that are in, engaged in sort of ubiquitous computing design process is how do we know that it works the way that we intended? Um, and for a typical sort of CS, um, HCI, technical um, development, the way that you can really test it beyond just a system is through deployment studies. Um, so there, there is a little dash of that, um, of having some deployment, and I'll talk a little bit about how uh, one study and how we did that. But sometimes it's just serendipity. Sometimes it just a situation arises that you have uh, a prototype for, um, and you get a chance to try it out. So um, so I'm gonna play a video from a study that I did for looking at memory sharing with between parents and young children. And this is an example of how we um, did a sort of deployment study to understand a future user experience. So let me set up the study for you and then I'll play the, the short video. So the question that we started with was, how do we help parents capture memories of their young children without ruining the moment? Um, and the key challenge was that even parents couldn't tell us what they wanted to capture about children. Otherwise, we could have just built an AI or something to do it. So we built uh, this um, kid keeper, which is the little froggy in the, in the frame, um, to not only 
sort of create a scenario in which parents were capturing memories of their kids, but also to get enough data from this memory capture process to go back and ask parents, what is it that you actually wanted? So we were, so we built this, uh, what's known as a technical probe, technology probe um, to, to create a scenario, a future scenario that would allow us to kind of anticipate and see what people's experiences were um, through like just some more natural interaction. Uh, so I'll play the video and please let me know if you can't hear it. How can we help parents capture memories of their children without missing out or disrupting the moment? We were inspired in our design process by parents who wanted to capture the voices of their children when they were young and rapidly changing. In interviews, parents said, the way they said certain words when they were two, you can't get that back. And those are little things that you see every day, but you don't have them captured. These audio memories of their children were more precious than they realized at the time. So we thought about how to enable parents to capture mementos of their children's voices. And then we thought, what if their children could capture these mementos themselves? We designed KidKeeper as a recording system for audio mementos of young children. It contains a microphone for recording and a speaker for playing back the recordings. Recording and playback is activated by a touch sensor. We used a Raspberry Pi to control the system and connect to the web. KidKeeper takes a toy-like form so kids can capture the mementos themselves. The system is embedded in a plush toy so it is engaging and approachable for young children. All recorded content is stored locally on the toy and it is also backed up in a private web database where we have simple quality filters. There is also an email server that can occasionally send recordings to parents so they can receive little audio mementos of their children wherever they are. I love you, Mommy and Daddy. I love you, Mommy and Daddy. Yeah, so, um, so we built this technology probe and we gave it to parents and, um, and their kids who are mainly about three or four years old, two to three, two to four years old, um, and as a way to sort of help them, put them in a scenario and envision how this, this entire memory capture could work. Um, and they had these for about a week, which we figured is about the amount of time it takes for kids to get tired of a toy. Um, and then um, we decided to, uh, yeah, so that they just used it regularly. We didn't monitor them. Um, we didn't um, sort of make them use it a certain amount of time. So this wasn't a, a sort of typical deployment study where you sort of require the people to use the technology in a particular way. We just wanted, we just gave it to them and said, use it whatever, however you want to. Um, so it's more of an exploratory, um, exploratory prototype um, as, as a type of probe. And this allowed um, us to kind of get um, an understanding about how this would be perceived and how it would be um, received, perceived and received by both parents and children, as well as giving us a lot of data to do a future study um, that we conducted with the parents to understand. So now that we can do this, what is it that you wanna record? Like what kind of memories about your kids is important to you? Um, and then we could you know, do future, we could, sort of build a classifier for that and things. But we had to start here with sort of creating the scenario that people could envision, envision the interaction with. So that was a planned deployment. Like we knew we needed to create, sort of we needed to create a future scenario in order to get any sort of interesting information about this. Um, but we also, I've also had sort of unplanned experiences. 
So um, this picture is also in, within the realm of family memory. Um, and this picture is from uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh. So in 2018, in July 29th, um, there were these huge citywide protests uh, that made, made national news. They shut the whole city down. And basically students, high school students and college students were protesting for better traffic safety. Um, because um, I don't know if y'all remember some of the details about this, but a young student um, was kind of running for the bus and had gotten run over by the bus that he was trying to catch and um, nothing happened. Like, there was no, um, no consequence. And even the prime minister of the country sort of went on national television and was like, stop talking about this, it doesn't matter. Um, and so students were quite upset about the fact that so many people die in traffic accidents, even though there's laws about traffic safety, but none of them ever get enforced. And so they were protesting to, for the enforcement of traffic laws. Um, but even though we saw in outside of Bangladesh, we saw a lot of news about this. Um, these sort of articles from Time Magazine, it was kind of, if you were listening, like watching the TV, because these were really big protests. They shut down the entire city for days and days and days. But inside of Bangladesh, there was nothing. There was no news whatsoever. And um, actually one of the students who had been working with me um, realized that the, understanding that she had in DACA about what was happening um, with all these protests was completely different than what her parents were um, seeing out um, outside of the city, um, even to the point where their like Facebook profiles and um, all the different like social media channels had been shut down and actively censored so that nothing about the protests could get outside of DACA within Bangladesh. Um, and so there was this sort of dichotomy between what people knew to be happening versus what the government was saying sort of in the, the news media about what was happening in Dhaka with these protests. And so this phenomenon of digital silencing gave a platform for something the student had built um, called the uh, Golpakatha app. And this was a, a storytelling app for families. Um, she was inspired by um, some of the work that had been done for family memory. And so she built this app for families in Bangladesh to go, you know, as they go visit their family members in different parts of the country, they can record their stories and then um, build a family tree out of them. And they have a gallery of images to sort of, sort of facilitate this um, sort of digital storytelling process. Um, and they had this app. So it was students, it was a group team of undergraduate students who built this as part of a class, but they had this app during the protests. And so they used the app to record all the stories from people during the protests who were in DACA but couldn't communicate out. And then they also recorded um, stories outside of the um, outside of the city to see what people were seeing. And then were able to sort of keep them um, in this sort of memory box basically, so that once everything died down, they could share these sort of in the moment reflections and thoughts and, and feelings with people who had been sort of on the outside of the digital fence. Um, so that was an interesting way to kind of see like how could these kind of technologies be used and appropriated in the future, even in ways that we didn't expect, um, but it kind of just came up. It wasn't planned. We didn't build the app for this. Um, and so sometimes like being able to evaluate a future user experience just is comes from having some a working prototype um, and then a situation comes up you're able to, to use it in. Um, so I'll kind of end uh, on this point. <clears throat> what do you do if you know what you design actually isn't very good? It isn't and not necessarily that it doesn't work, right? But that people just don't want to use it or they don't want to use it the way that you've envisioned. Um, and especially in uh, ubiquitous computing environment, right? Like it's something that's maybe they don't even have a choice about using. It's somebody over there who's using it, but it's affecting my life. How do we account for that? Um, and we haven't really thought much about it um, as designers, but um, we're starting to. So there's these kind of buzzwords getting tossed around, disuse, non-use, contestation, refusal, removal, um, and so that's, we're starting to think about 
how do we uh, support people who want to unplug, who don't want to use a particular platform or system, who want to refuse a particular set of data collection, um, who want to not be involved in any sort of process. But have we thought about this in terms of user experience design? Like, have we thought about how we can intentionally design for these sort of things? Um, because we are now a lot of this sort of refusal and non-use uh, is through regulation, right? People fleeing the technology and going to the regulators, to the, to the politicians or the law writers to say, please help us, this technology is ruining my life. But that means we as US and others have failed. So I want to leave with kind of that thought of like, when we're thinking about ubiquitous computing, and we're thinking about futures that um, where technology is everywhere, it's all around us, it's woven into the fabric of everyday life, it's affecting not only our physical environment, but also our social relationships. How can we let people not engage? That's also a part of user experience design, especially when we're thinking about future experiences. So to all of you kind of future designers, the ubiquitous computing future technologies that come, will they come by invitation because we've designed them well, we've thought about all the people that they are um, engaging with, we've thought about how, whether they work or not, and we've also thought about ways that people can step back or disengage by choice, or will it be by invasion? Will it just be us making things and forcing people to use them either indirectly or, or directly? And how do we make sure that that is a positive future for everyone? So I'll close there um, with the question for you all. Um, and I'll also take questions about through the content of the talk and everything that you've read. To. Thank you so much, Jasmine. <clears throat> this has been a really cool presentation. Um, so we'll start taking questions. Um, I would like to urge you all to unmute yourselves and ask your questions as you have them. Um, just because sometimes they're a little long in the chat and it gets hard to make sure I've captured everything. But I see we have a question from Amal. Um, are you planning to extend this technology to include videos too? Um, and Amal, I think you're talking about the Kid Keeper system. And uh, no, it was specifically for audio mementos um, because video capture had already been shown to be a no-go, you know, always on video capture is a no-go inside homes with young children. Um, but so we were trying to explore like, what is audio then the way to sort of help parents capture memories of their kids, even when they're not, not necessarily there? Yeah, good question. Okay, Kun Lin, do you want to answer, uh, ask your question out loud? It's a little long. Yep, I know, I know you were talking about me. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, my question is about, I really appreciate like you want to consider all the social aspects in the technology design process. I think it's very valuable, but also I think it's very challenging. For example, because like the main issue is it's hard to decide what the boundary you should set for the social environment for technology to consider. For example, in your, uh, the family memory project, it is a little bit easier to design uh, to consider all the factors because like the family is a closed environment. Like it's mainly including uh, the family members, individuals inside of the family. But for the blind student project, they are facing a more open social environment. More individuals can influence like the the, their experience about the technology, stuff like that. So my question is, <clears throat> sorry, my question is how how do you decide, how do you define the social factors you need, to, you want to consider in the technology? How to, do you decide what is the boundary the technology should consider? So I hope I have it clearly. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that question. And I, um, Deciding the boundary of like who should you consider and who you should just kind of hope works um, is that's a that's a I mean it's a tough one because on the one hand 
you could try to keep all the power as the designer and say like, I'm gonna make the choice based on what I know and I'm the expert in this situation. Or you could ask your potential sort of your target group. I think all of these sort of settings still do have a potential target user group, right? So you could ask them about, you know, who do you really, who do you interact with? And, um, and you know, who is gonna be involved and engaged in this? <clears throat> you could, Spent, do some ethnography and go sit there and watch, right? Because everybody's, I think, you know, people can tell you who's in their family, for example, um, but there's there's all sorts of sort of fuzzy areas, right? Like the cousin who always comes over, like, is that is that a, is that a member of your family? Um, or do you consider that to be sort of extended or extra extra, extra family? Um, so kind of doing the sit and see um, method, um, and so I think that's where I think the power of participatory design really comes in. That's also where the power of doing a probe, a technology probe um, is really nice because um, you don't have to make that decision in advance of the, your design process, right? Like you can, you can create something solely for the purpose of eliciting sort of more of these social, um, social actions and interactions and then see what, see what comes up, see what happens. Um, and then you kind of have to sort of in conversation with the people who are all involved, then um, sort of make that determination about how do you, how do you set your boundaries or how do you sort of consider the impacts to all the different people. I see. Thank you so much. Just a one like, very tiny uh, comment. I think you are so right. Like, but on the other side, I also think it's, it's not a, only technologies uh, issue or responsibility. The social culture, like there are some other factors in this in, around the technology is also important to set up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for <clears throat> sure. Yeah, it definitely technology can only solve technology problems. Um, so definitely if if you have like a um, sort of um, an environment that's negative and you're trying to introduce some sort of positive intervention, the technology is not going to change the negative social aspect either. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, it definitely has to be a conversation and sort of um, effort by all involved. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, I'll let it be presenter's choice. Jasmine, do you want to see yes, a me... number of them in the chat? Okay, um, so I'll try to answer uh, a couple of, there's a couple of ones specific to KidKeeper about could it be used for the elderly or could there be other types of audio or video uploaded there directly? Um, yes, yes, all, all versions, there could be many different versions for, for KidKeeper, but you probably have to think about the design differently, um, right? Like uh, elderly people are not necessarily entertained by hearing their voices played back to them. So, um, you know, thinking about the, the interaction design would be a little bit, would be different, it would be different. But you could definitely apply the same sort of thinking and process to it. Um, but do I anticipate the embedding of technologies in everyday objects to continue or is it starting to taper off? Oh, I think it is just starting to begin. Um, I think we, the, like the, the vision that is driving a lot of computer science research, especially on the hardware side, is this, idea of ubiquitous computing, where like, you don't know that you're interacting with a computer. It's just acting and interacting nat naturally with you. Um, and so everything from like tiny batteries to tiny microchips to tiny actuators to paper electronics, I think y'all had to talk about that before, right? Like all of that is sort of part of this um, future and vision of ubiquitous computing. So I definitely think this is where things are going. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jasmine. This has really been a great presentation and a really fun topic. Um, Dr. Jones has her contact information up on the screen. If you have future questions or points that you want to engage um, with this research. And yeah, thank you all for coming. Yes, feel free to use.